It's the focus of an intense ethical and political debate going on in America today. Gun control campaigners point to the carnage in our schools and on the streets of our cities. Organizations like the National Rifle Association run glossy commercials proclaiming the right of every citizen to bear arms. Politicians argue about the scope of legislation. Everyone's agreed that something needs to be done about the violence in our society, but what? In this series, we're trying to read the signs of the times in response to the challenge of Jesus Christ. What's going on in our world? Underneath all of the images and icons of popular culture, what are the spiritual forces that are at work shaping us and motivating us? That the gun is some kind of sign of our times, there can be little doubt. For even as the political debate rages, through television, the movies, magazines, it continues to exercise a powerful and romantic grip on the public imagination. On the walls of our culture, and maybe of our minds, the gun is written in words of fascination and of fear. The weapons you see around you are all military weapons, and they were designed to be the most efficient killing machine of the day. And uh, this is a process that has continued on to today. The guns hold a fascination to me because each one of them is a little technical marvel within itself, and then some of the others are just absolute masterpieces of craftsmanship of the period. When you see the guns that were presented to some of the heads of states of Europe in the 17th and 16th centuries and 18th centuries, they are absolutely gorgeous. Beverly DeBose is an Atlanta businessman whose family has a long and serious interest in American military history. He has his own extensive collection of guns and memorabilia. The gun has been a part by necessity of American history from the very beginning. And it's something that you can't separate from, from that history because at the time you could not separate a man from his gun. It was just an absolute necessary tool for not only defense but survival uh, in providing food for the family. Guns are such a ubiquitous part of American history because they were integral to the daily life for so long as well as the military actions. And if you think about this country, it was, in essence, wrested from the Native American Indians at the time. Or well, you can call them earlier immigrants, if you will. Uh, and so the flintlock musket was a part of that. It was also very much, you think of the wars we were involved in from our very onset, you know. We were involved fighting England, was fighting France. England was fighting Spain and the colonists were the extension of England's foreign policy. So we were constantly involved in some sort of combat as a result of the politics of Europe. There's no doubt that the gun has indeed played a real and important role in American history. But in the popular imagination, and particularly in the movies, it's now achieved an almost mythic status. Bart Palmer is professor of English and communication at Georgia State and has written about the mystique of the gun in a book called Hollywood's Dark Cinema. One of the, one of the persistent themes of American culture is the conflict between um, established law and order and natural law and order. And um, one, of the, one of the ways in which our cultural objects, particularly films, work this out is often by presenting conflicts between the claims of law uh, to settle disputes and to establish a social order, and the claims of an individual using what we might call righteous violence to establish law and social order. And in fact, we have a good many cultural forms that more or less suggest that the a claim of natural law, of the individual, the charismatic hero to establish social order, is higher for us 
than that of established law and order. Uh, it's particularly true in the Western. The Western is the greatest American uh, cultural product to illustrate the uh, claim of natural law. And uh, the image of the cowboy is constructed very much around this idea of uh, individuality, of uh, isolation from society, of uh, a need for uh, self-definition, and all those uh, qualities become wrapped up in the uh, possession of the gun. The cowboy is no one without his gun. One of the interesting things about the image of the cowboy, however, is that he's often presented in American movies as a reluctant hero. That is, uh, violence is the last resort uh, of such a character. His, his violence is therefore always righteous. It's always provoked by lawbreakers, by those who uh, transgress, by those who violate the law. And then the cowboy has to step in and restore law and order using the gun. Uh, this is uh, a very potent American myth. It's why I think that we as a country have such a difficulty with any notion of gun control because we all imagine ourselves as cowboys in the last resort. When the law fails, then it's up to us to shoot it out with the bad guys. But the consequences of this glorification of violence on the streets of our society is something that very much concerns Dr. Joseph Lowry, who's president of the Southern Christian Leadership Conference. Well, I think that the age in which we live has pretty thoroughly affirmed violence as an acceptable means of resolving conflict, whether that's international policies and conflicts, uh, from Desert Storm to, to the electric chair to the movies to, to even our music, violence has been affirmed as uh, acceptable behavior in resolving conflict. And the gun is a symbol of violence. Uh, uh, and I'm afraid we're not listening to, to the biblical uh, word about he who lives by the sword uh, will perish by the sword. And I think the gun, the smart bum, uh, the missiles, uh, all of these things are, are signs that we are, our values are deteriorating, our, our concept of life as a sacred lease from God, and I say lease deliberately because I think we are held accountable for it. Wherever it's a gift, we don't feel the level of accountability we do with a lease. We've lost sight of the fact that life is a sacred lease from God and that we are going to be held accountable. And violence is a denial of the sacredness of life. And uh, we're wasting God's gifts and resources uh, on violence. Uh, flying over the Midwest the other day, I saw the devastating impacts of the flood. And flying in this jet plane and uh, enjoying all this technology, it just occurred to me that we couldn't do anything with the fury of the river. All of our technology, walking on the moon, scraping the bowels of the ocean, we still could do nothing but what we did hundreds of years ago, and that's pass sandbags uh, to try to hold back the fury of the river. And, and maybe God is speaking to us through the river, and maybe the message is you can't shoot a river. Uh, we can't solve all our problems by, by violence. And until we learn that, uh, uh, we're going to sow the wind and reap the whirlwind. And that's what we're doing. We're reaping the whirlwind of having a firm violence as an acceptable means of resolving conflict. The SCLC is committed to combating the mystique of the gun in America, particularly among the young. But as the public debate over gun control demonstrates, the gun lobby is able to appeal to some powerful emotions in support of its case. I think that in this context of, of the debate over guns and gun control, the, the, the role of the NRA uh, is able to stir or to touch uh, that kind of hidden fear that someone wants to disarm you, so to speak. And I think that if you look at the vast, vast, vast majority of people who own guns uh, that have never committed a crime and have never killed anybody and used the guns only for recreational purposes or home protection, if you will, to make them to feel better, uh, that 
they have a, a fear that, that once you take one step, then it leads to another step, and it leads to another step. And there are groups in this country that would frankly love to see total disarming of society. Their theory is if you disarm the populace, the only people who will have weapons are the criminals, and I firmly believe that that's the case. I mean, you have the Sullivan Law in New York, which is probably the most stringent handgun law in the world. The people up there shot right, left, and center all the time, because if you want one, you can get it somewhere. The stand that organizations like the SCLC have taken on the issue of violence has been principled and consistent. But it has also been extremely costly, prompting many people to question the efficacy of this witness. We think that real power is spiritual power. That material power, the power of a gun, the power of a sword, even the power of wealth, uh, is not basic, authentic power. That basic, authentic power comes from a sense of selfhood, a sense of myself as a child of God, and the power to love, the power to forgive, the power to heal, the power of struggle. Uh, the power is in the struggle. Uh, well, There's an African proverb that says, the joy of life is in the struggle, and that the victory belongs to God, but that our responsibility is to struggle. And, and, and it's, it's power in the struggle. We, can, we didn't have any, any guns to change the segregation laws. We didn't use any guns. We used our spirits. We used our love. We used our commitment to justice. And it was more powerful than the fire hoses. Uh, I watched in Birmingham as, as uh, humble, simple people with, in faith walked on toward the cross. And firemen they ignored the order to turn the hoses on. Uh, they ignored, policemen ignored the order to turn the dog loose because the power of the presence of God in children, in simple people, changed their minds, changed their hearts. That's the only real power. The power of guns, the power of bums, creates more problems than ever resolved. That kind of raw power does not resolve problems. It creates problems. Problems are solved in, in love and in the power of the spirit. The gun, a collector's item, an image in celluloid, a toy in the hands of our children, a symbol of violence. With me to discuss this complex and disturbing aspect of our culture are Marcia Riggs, who's professor of Christian ethics here at Columbia Theological Seminary, and Brian Childs, who's professor of pastoral theology and counseling. Brian, when we think about the signs of the times, I mean, it's easy to get sort of disheartened and depressed about what's going on in our culture. But I think when we come to the gun, it's easy to get really apocalyptic, isn't it? Yeah, my experience uh, working in an inner city hospital over the last uh, nine years in, in Atlanta is, is an example of that. When I first came here, the majority of the traumas that came in on the weekends were uh, automobile accidents. Now there's no question the majority of the traumas are uh, gunshot wounds. And we now have armed guards uh, in the emergency room because people who have done the shooting often come to the emergency room to finish the job. And so there are armed guards to protect the physicians and other staff and the patients from uh, persons who may come into the hospital with guns of their own. Do you get any sense of the age of these people? I mean, is it covering all age groups or is it particularly the, the it's, very young? It's, it's young people. It'll be uh, generally people in their late teens, early 20s. Do you get depressed about that? I don't know what to do. Yes, very much so. Marcia, when, when it comes to th thinking about the kind of dynamics that are involved in this, the sort of vicious circle that's involved, I mean, it seems like when you get um, reports on the news of, of horrific shootings and all that sort of thing, for all of those people who say we must do something, we must get, a, get rid of guns, there are others who will actually use that as a, an argument to say, well, I ought to go out and buy one. I ought to actually get one to protect myself. Well, I think that that's the case because people feel like they're caught in a crossfire. And literally, there are people caught in crossfires. Children who live in uh, public housing, for example, you know, are always getting inadvertently shot by uh, drive-by shootings and so forth. Uh, but you also have uh, folks in their homes feeling, you know, violated by intruders and therefore needing protection. So this whole image and feeling of being caught in the crossfire is, is critical. Do you understand that uh, desire to actually go out and buy one to protect yourself? 
Yeah, I think I've even had that desire, but haven't ever acted on it, uh, just because it, it gets frightening. Um, how are you going to protect yourself, for example, as an oppressed person in society, uh, a black youth, for example, or a woman who feels like, you know, the fundamental nature of society is unjust uh, and that perhaps police aren't even going to protect you? So, you know, that you might even be the object of their violence. Uh, therefore, yeah, why not? Get a gun, protect yourself. What kind of, uh, as a Christian, what kind of Christian principles or Christian kind of biblical uh, texts or whatever did kind of form your own thinking, your own reaction to what's happening with respect to the gun, Brian? Well, the, the the first thing that comes to mind is one of the nicknames for gun uh, for a gun is is the equalizer. Now, you know that's an, that's an interesting that's a very important theological concept, equalization, the the leveling kind of thing. And but when you when you when you refer to the gun as an equalizer, what you're really talking about is is the oppression of another person or the blowing them away, getting them out of your way, so that they're, they're no longer there's no longer an other in which you. Could um, be possibly in conflict with or in disagreement with. That runs counter to the notion of equalization that uh, that Paul might be talking about when when he's he's uh, he's uh, telling the Colossian uh, community about uh, neither Jew nor Gentile or a male or female or free or slave. I mean, that's a different kind of equalization that honors uh, differences possibly, but honors life and the, the equalization of the. Gun Gun means that one lives and the other one doesn't. Mm -hmm. see well, I guess for me, because I think really the fundamental issue is anxiety, you know, that, that folks are anxious about their lives in many ways. Uh, I found myself uh, looking at the gospel text in Matthew, for example, where the passage that talks about, you know, uh, are you anxious about what you're going to wear, what you're going to eat, all this? Why are you so anxious? <laughs> you know, um, and I think about that in terms of um, our losing sight of who oversees the world, you know, the whole issue of God's sovereignty and how that uh, occurs in our lives and, and for us, as well as a kind of flawed way of valuing that we have at work. You know, we are concerned about having clothes and having this and having that, uh, and then defending it and keeping it, you know. So um, that whole, like I said, gospel text that deals with anxiety and valuing and really looking and seeing who's in control, who's overseeing this. Yeah, it's a, a cheap novel that I remember once reading, Fear is the Key. <laughs> um, it's that fear really drives, uh, drives so many things that we do. Do you think that uh, that's something we can be released from as a culture? I mean, or is that something we simply have to live with? Well, I would hope that it's something we can be released from. And I think, I mean, I think in the Christian community, at least, if, in fact, we affirm, you know, who actually oversees the world, um, then, yeah, we're, we're freed up, at least, not to be so anxious, or we're at least freed up to try and have some hope in the midst of the anxiety <laughs> in a way that I'm not sure uh, necessarily the rest of the culture. Uh, now, our interface with the culture is the question, too. How do we help translate or help other people feel hopeful in the midst of anxiety so that they react differently? Can you be hopeful? <laughs> Well, I'm not terribly hopeful. I, I, while I, I agree with uh, Marcy on the, you know, the kind of the normative or the idealized uh, notion of Christian hope, um, I, I guess I'm somewhat of an empiricist and a pessimist and say that it seems like the human condition is driven by anxiety. And unfortunately, the, the way that most of us tend to avoid the anxiety is, is, is through the expression of power somehow, whether it be economic power or, or violence, physical power, uh, or anesthetizing ourselves uh, from feeling the anxiety. So it seems like we, we're just consumed with it. And I think that the real, the, the real problem is what you pointed to, Mercy, was how is this translated, the, our, our Christian hope and value, when in fact 
uh, it seems that that is a gross, uh, I mean, a, a, a very uh, minority position mm -hmm. in a culture that uh, seems to honor uh, the violence and, um, and typify anxiety is, is, is the way it's supposed to be. So, I mean, the other piece of that for me, too, in trying to translate that hope is also helping people understand that there is another way to see power, too. Mm -hmm. The power doesn't have to be oppressive or about mm -hmm. controlling the other. That power could also be about how one um, enhances life, yeah. how one generates life, how one, you know... There's a very interesting uh, sort of dynamic in uh, in the gospel, uh, in, in in the epistles of Paul, particularly uh, between power and weakness, and what yeah. constitutes power in this world, and what real where real power lies. Uh, a verse I'm thinking of is in one Corinthians, one you know the word of the cross is folly to those who are perishing, to those who are being saved. It's the power of God. For the foolishness of God is wiser than human beings. The weakness of God is stronger than human beings. What's that all about? What's the, what's the, what is the power of God uh, in, in terms of uh, when related to human power? Well, um, and this isn't my own thought. I, I'll say others before who thought probably more deeply than I at this point about it would say, on the one hand, it seems to me that uh, when you look at a text like that, the power of God, one way of looking at it might be that the power of God is that which gives life even in the midst of violence. You know, that um, because the power of the cross is about resurrection. So if we focus on, that's one way of focusing on it, is the power of God is about giving life in spite of the fact that the reality is a violent reality, which is, you know... Um, so for me, you know, and I think that's a position I would have to go with, sort of, because um, there's something fundamental about the fact that our central symbol, the cross, is also a very violent symbol, mm -hmm. you know. Uh, so how do we sort of redeem the cross even mm -hmm. uh, in the midst of that is, is because we have resurrection. Something to do with maybe the courage to endure is, as well, uh, seems to me, is, is, is relevant. Mm -hmm. What form do you think a, a Christian witness on the gun should actually take in our culture today? I mean, it's, you know, we, can, we can sit and talk about it, right. uh, but are we just wringing our hands? I mean, what, what, what form should a Christian stance towards the gun and the myths associated with the gun take? Well, on, on the one hand, um, I think we clearly have to be uh, oppositional to the myth and the ideology of the gun, uh, helping people to see that the power that comes with owning a gun or having a gun to defend oneself is, uh, is not all there is to power. You know, the power of God, the cross, gives us another vision of power. That's one thing. Um, However, because I really do think there's an awful lot of structural violence in the society, uh, I can't in and of myself say that the only Christian ethical stance would be to uh, be nonviolent and therefore never take up arms or guns. So it's kind of on the one hand, but on the other. Yeah. Brian, how about For you? Me. <laughs> Yeah, I, I'm. Uh, I, I tend to agree with that. I, I think uh, another another element, uh, maybe less, um, um, a little bit more individual, uh, individually based, is um, that we can make some kind of um, stance. Is how do we value life? Uh, you know, guns, when pistols anyway, are, are generally the ones that you see in the streets and the one you hear about are not target pistols. Mm -hmm. These are these are this is machinery designed to kill or maim. That's the only reason they exist. And that's certainly true of the street sweepers and the automatic weapons. They are designed to create physical harm. Okay. Now, what is that saying in the proliferation? Is What does that say about human life? Um, you know, we're, we're also in a culture now that, that asks questions about should physicians be allowed to uh, help people terminate their own lives? Mm -hmm. And without asking the question is what is life? And how, what, do we, what does it mean to us as Christians? What is our 
our responsibility to it as ownership or as stewardship what so I think that um, I think we need to really reevaluate what is what is the meaning of, of life what does God intend for it and uh, that's the uh, one of the relevant questions for for um, uh, guns. You know, I, I I hitch up when I hear you say, "Well, I don't rule out uh, violence in response to oppression." And one of the reasons I hitch up is because I may be one of the oppressors, mm -hmm. and so I have a, a self interest in that there, there that that not be a position we can take. Um, on the other hand, I, I I can I'm not a pacifist either. I certainly would defend my my children uh, with every last breath that I have. And so it is, it is when I'm more honest with myself on the one hand and on the other. But I think the structural violence that we have in, in our society, the, the availability of guns, it's so easy. We could go out on the streets of Atlanta and get a gun in 20 minutes. Um, or we could legally get one in, in a couple of days. Um, is is rather um, is rather frightening, and we we talk about using guns in in political interventions or uh, around the country and so or in, in the world. So it's in terms of taking the kind of spiritual pulse of our culture, mm -hmm. if that's possible. What does this actually say to us about where we are at this point, the late twentieth century? Where are we? Mm. It probably says something about uh, <laughs> the pulse is pretty weak, <laughs> the patient uh, uh, needs reviving. Um, the patient we, may need a heart transplant. Uh, yeah, we, we really uh, aren't taking our cues from the Judeo-Christian heritage that we say is a part of us. Uh, I think that's sort of become submerged more and more, and other value systems have more sway. Well, my thanks to Marcia Riggs and Brian Childs for joining me to discuss the gun. Thank you for your company. In the next program, we're going to be talking about the game, sport in America, as a sign of our times. So I hope you can join us then. Until then, from all of us here, goodbye. <laughs> <laughs>